Thanks very much, John. Good evening, everyone. This is an ideal opportunity to talk about colour, which is my favourite topic, because it brings together art and science in the most splendid way. And so I'm going to, in this talk, going to be saying something about the rainbow and then about the spectrum, as we shall see the two of them are intimately linked. My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. So is it when my life began. So it is now I am a man. So be it when I shall grow old. The child is father of the man. These are the words of William Wordsworth in 1802. I still have that feeling of wonder when I see a rainbow. It's something extraordinary. It's slightly preternatural. It's engaged the interest of philosophers and artists for thousands of years. At the very beginning, the Renaissance, Matthias Grunewald painted this um, in his uh, town church in Stuttgart. And you see that the Madonna has not a, a halo, but a rainbow, a nimbus over the head, within which is enclosed somehow the radiance that uh, sanctifies her and shows the, the blessing of the Father above. Rubens experimented frequently with rainbows. Many of his pictures show the rainbow in some way. Now it's curious that there are not many colours in this rainbow. Just like the previous one, which had only two colours really. This, this is primarily blue and yellow with a, a hint of pink. So its presence here is not meant to be pictorial so much as symbolic. This idyllic pastoral scene where man and the animals are in harmony with nature is somehow blessed, is somehow complete because of its, its naturalness. Angelica Kaufman, the co-founder of the Royal Academy of Cultural Reynolds, made this um, nice self-portrait. The painting of the rainbow was a test in skill, just like the painting of circles that you see in the, the Rembrandt at Kenwood House. It's a, it shows the mastery of painterly techniques, not only in the curvature, but also in the transparency and translucency of the, the painting itself. Note that it also, by doing this, she is somehow taking on this radiance of the rainbow, perhaps echoing back to the stupa Madonna. This is some kind of simplification of her as a painter and of her endeavours in London society and the founding of the Royal Academy. Turner painted rainbows on a number of occasions. And as with all Turner, he's creating impressions, especially the effect of space and light and lumens within a scene. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that Turner may have been tritonopic, because in many of his paintings, almost all the colors are on this uh, axis from yellow to blue. So we see here, very few colours that are not within that uh, ambit. But the rainbow here is, is brilliant. It stands out above the scene. <coughs> so 
Surat also experimented with rainbow. This is his study for the babies at Tasmania. This is in the National Gallery, as is the, the real portrait. And it's curious that when he came to paint the, the, the actual painting, um, the bathers, he omitted the rainbow. But it's here in this study. And you see that it's, it has this wonderful lightness and intangibility. It's somehow um, conveyed through his um, pointillistic, impressionistic technique. It just shimmers in the background above the scene. Well, rainbows normally come in pairs. They have not only the primary bow, but also a secondary bow above it. In between is a dark space known as the Alexander Band. If you look carefully at this, you see that the colours in the two bows are reversed. In the, the main bow, the lower and brighter one, always the, the short wavelengths, the blue and the violet, are towards the bottom, the longer wavelengths, the orange and red, are towards the top. Whereas in the upper bow, which um, is concentric with it, the order is reversed, so the red is at the bottom and the violet is at the top. This is in the countryside in Italy. Now why do we get this phenomenon? Why does it happen? Oh, uh, this double rainbow, I meant to say, is um, something that John Constable was very interested in. He painted uh, double rainbows on a number of occasions. This is the first one, uh, just a fragment really, which is in the V&A. And you see that for all his painterly technique, his keen observation, he actually made a mistake. And he put the second bow, the outer one, the order of the colors is the same as the first. He actually got it wrong. 24 years later, in, um, he painted this scene near where he lived on Hampstead Heath. And uh, this time he got it the right way around. But once again, these, these bows are not meant to be victoriously accurate. They're adding to the scene. They're creating some kind of impression of what it was like and of the, the prevailing weather and the, the, the beauty of the scene. So let's turn now to optics. Why do rainbows go at all? Well, the reason is that light coming from the sun is refracted by droplets of water, raindrops, hanging in the air. And they follow, in a spherical raindrop, they follow a very particular path. That they're refracted as they enter the uh, first surface from air into the water. And that refraction acts like a prism and separates the wavelengths, with the blue being bent more towards the normal and the red being bent less. There's a total internal reflection at the right on the far side of the droplet, and then a further uh, refraction, bending of the rays as they exit at the bottom. And the observer sees the light that's coming down from there. Now I can demonstrate this effect. I brought along some equipment from the lab. And so I'm casting a, a slit of light here. Can everyone, can everyone see that? And it's falling onto this uh, cylindrical piece of perspex. This is a section through a um, perspex rod. If I move this, get it at just the right angle, you can see that the path of those rays internally, I don't know whether 
you can see that. You need to be closer. But from where I am, I can quite clearly see that, that uh, path. And so the rays are going through here. They're reflected off the back. They're emerging out here. And if I put a, a white screen in the way, move this, you can just see the, the reflected, refracted light emerging here at an angle of uh, just on 40 degrees of deflection to the original beam. So this is straightforward optics. Everything is explained. Well, not quite, because if, if this were the whole story, you would expect in the primary boat to see red at the bottom and violet at the top. So why don't we see that? Well, the reason is that different droplets are being involved. There's a whole cloud of, of raindrops. And so droplets at this position reflecting or refracting, deflecting those rays at 40 degrees come to the observer. Droplets that are here or lower down below uh, deflect the rays at 42 degrees and the observer sees them there. So the apparent position of the violet is actually lower because the angle of deflection from the sunlight is greater. And so droplets anywhere around that circle, which from that angle from the observer's eye in all directions, will produce that same effect, which is why the, the rainbow is a bow. It's a circular arc. And if it weren't for the Earth, uh, at the horizon, we would see a complete circle. The secondary bow is caused by a double reflection of the rays within the drops. So we have two internal reflections. In this case, they enter here, and the path is upwards. Second reflection to there, and then uh, exit there. And in this case, you see the primary bow is brighter, and it has this colors fall in this range of angles from 42 to 40 degrees. Uh, the secondary bow is paler, and the uh, rays fall within this, this range from 52 to 54 degrees. From some positions, if you're perched high above a waterfall, you may actually be able to see a complete circular rainbow. It's uh, something that's uh, very appealing for tourists. Occasionally, if you're looking out the aircraft window on top of clouds, you may see something that looks like a rainbow, a complete circle <coughs> enveloping the shadow of the aircraft on top of the cloud. This is not actually a rainbow, it's a different mechanism of formation, and it's more correctly known as glory. The phenomenon is, is one of the glory, so it's a broader pattern and it's uh, close, the angle is not 42, but closer to the you know, visual axis. One of the strong um, Talking about the symbolism of the rainbow, something that has great power is the story from the Bible, God's covenant with Noah after the flood. Reading in Genesis, you see this verse 13, I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. I will remember my covenant, and the waters shall no more 
to kind of flood, to destroy all the flesh. So this is a, a very powerful association, saying that when we see the rainbow in the sky, we remember God's promise that he's not going to send another flood. There are all sorts of mythology about the rainbow. This is particularly the end of the rainbow, this place where the intangible meets the tangible and comes to earth. And the Irish especially have this um, idea that there's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. I had friends of mine told me that they were on holiday in Ireland and they going on country road in the middle of the day, they came round the corner, found the road was closed, and a group of Irish workmen were digging it up. And they went to ask why, and the team leader explained that when, they, when the workmen arrived at work that morning, there'd been a rainbow, just like this, on the road, and they knew that there must be gold nearby, so they, they set it up, they were. So what's the symbolism of the rainbow? It's something rather wonderful. It's supernatural. It's evanescent, ephemeral. It's sacred. It's, it's wholesome. So interesting to look at uh, logos and graphics to see how those ideas are borne out. In children's charity where there is indeed some sort of feeling of protection and, and wholesomeness. But this metaphor gets, quickly gets uh, debased. Here's a, a local uh, swimming pool. As soon as advertising men get hold of these things, they're, they're completely uh, subverted. And uh, here's Disney with their customary modesty have not one but two pots of gold. <laughs> well, this brings us to the spectrum. Um, we're all in, the, in debt to Isaac Newton, who, when he was 19 years old uh, and at uh, Trinity College in Cambridge, he was experimenting with a prison that he bought at the local fair. See what, um, try to quantify this visual phenomenon. Here's a sketch from his notebook which shows how he made a small hole in the blind or curtain on his window. The light passed through a lens, through this upturned prison, and uh, created a uh, spectrum on a, on a screen on the other side. He also made a drawing of the, um, uh, the order of the colors of the observer and the relative coverage of those colors in the spectrum to help draw the band from each one was. So I have here the essential elements of Newton's um, experiment, the source of light, and slit around the vertebra. And I uh, have here a, a lens at one end and a prism at the other. this the light is passing through the slit through this lens being focused onto the prism and you see a very nice bright spectrum is produced there's also a second one and this uh, this is a symmetrical so these are the diffraction is, is in both directions from the prism colors are there in the spectrum? It's 
not obvious, is it? It's not easy to say. You might think one, two, three, four, perhaps. You might think five. Newton was a numerologist, so he decided that there were seven colors. So these are the colors we learned at school red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. What's indigo? What does indigo mean there? Well, maybe, maybe blue is really kind of turquoise or cyan. In that case, indigo is the royal blue that's just lurking there between the cyan and the violet. The Newton's ideas were adopted enthusiastically by all scientists. However, poets and philosophers didn't always agree, particularly Goethe, uh, strongly took issue with Newton and spent a good deal of his life challenging and decrying the Newtonian theories. Goethe believed that uh, the spectrum was, was more like this, that it was white, tinged with uh, blue on one side and uh, yellow, orange on the other side, and that these were somehow linked to transition between white and black and black and white. Newton wasn't wrong, but this is clearly the way the prism works. Watch what happens, however, if I rotate the prism here. Spectrum holds. If I move the lens towards the prism, this is defocusing the pattern. And there it is, there's Goethe's spectrum. So what's happened? It's the same light, it's the same apparatus. All I've done is to defocus the spectrum. So now at each point, the wavelengths are spread out across them. The full width here is a whole series of spectra which are convolved together on top of one another. So in the central regions, we're getting light from all wavelengths, and they're adding, of course, to white. Whereas at the edges, we still have the, the fringes of the standard Newtonian spectrum. So there's no contradiction between these two. Goethe was right in what he observed, but he wasn't a scientist. Newton was much more uh, rigorous and systematic in the way that he went about it. I can make a more interesting spectrum instead of with a prism by using a diffraction grating. I'm just going to turn this around once more and you'll we'll see it more clearly. The prism, of course, is transmitting the light through. Fraction is reflecting it. So we have the 
The colours here are related to the wavelength of light, which had been dispersed by the great This is the shortest wavelengths, down to about 400 nanometers, the longest up to about 750, about here. And broadly, we can say that the, the spectrum is in three parts. There's a red, a green, and a blue. I can filter these with uh, transmission filters. So here, a set of um, rapid filters from Kodak. These are gelatin embedded in glass. Does everyone remember Kodak? <laughs> Green and blue. And so watch what happens if I put these into the light path. Here's the red. So it's blocking all of the green and blue wavelengths. It's allowing only the red to pass through. If I use the green filter, it blocks the red and blue, it allows green and yellow to pass. There's still some residual orange, not so much. And with the blue, we get uh, blue and violet, it blocks the others. So the light that's passing through these is really quite similar to the primary lights from the projector up here, you see on the main screen. This whole image up here is made from red, green and blue lights, which are combined together at each pixel position. So what is it that this prism, which is projected here onto the screen, is not so bright as this one? This spectrum is, is much brighter, more colorful, more intense than the representation up there. This is the most colorful I can get in the digital system. Well, the reason is that this is made from those broadband lights. It's broad red and broad green and broad blue. Whereas this is made from monochromatic light. At every position there, we have light just at a single wavelength, which by definition is the most pure. So this is what um, is codified into the CIE system, the um, well-known chromatistic diagram. And its boundary, this horseshoe-shaped boundary, represents those monochromatic lights. So it's each pure wavelength. But the projector, in fact any real uh, trichromatic system, has a much more limited gamut. It's the primaries, the red, the green, and the blue, at the corners of the triangle. Delineate the range of colors, the gamut of colors that can be produced by the light. And by definition, those colors are not so intense as the pure spectral colors. And finally, we talk about symbolism of the rainbow. The spectrum also has its own symbolism. To me, the, the true spectrum there is something slightly ghostly and mysterious. In fact, it was Newton himself who coined the word spectrum because of the spectral or ghostly quality of the, of the phenomenon. But it's also it's simulating, so brilliant. It somehow includes all of the components of light. It has an order to it, and there's some uh, significance or meaning to it. So what kind of layers do we see? Well, there are color reduction companies like Conica to respect the order of the colors. Not all logos do this. You see um, the gay pride flag has only six out of the seven colors. 
uh, at least they are in right order. And in C, uh, take a liberty to extend, <laughs> transpose the purple and the green. When you look at Apple, they have completely reordered the colors of the spectrum. It's curious, isn't it? This is whether it was Steve Jobs or some graphic designer, I don't know, but it's, it's those colors are not spectral colors. In fact, the sign at the bottom is uh, his knowledge of non spectral. So what do you make of Technicolor, the, the Hollywood film company? Their spectrum follows the colors of Apple. Isn't that surprising? It's not film color at all. So that's it. Finally, I um, note that the logo of the color group, Great Britain, which I'm a life member, is the full Newtonian spectrum with seven colors and long may continue. <laughs> And this might be quite a stupid question, but um, with the, um, we obviously have red coming in and then you're going all the way through the spectrum to blue. But then in the color wheel, when you mix red and blue, you get purple. So maybe that might be some of the source of the logos where they're sort of juxtaposing their purple and their red. Um, but is there a simple explanation of that, or is it just to do with the color wheel? The way we perceive Red and blue makes yeah. to be purple. It was um, Newton's genius, really, that he joined the ends of the spectrum together, effectively he wrapped them around, joining the longest to the shortest through the purple. Because the, this violet here has a hint of red about it, and so it makes sense to, to join back here. However, there are some hues which are not within the spectrum, so magenta and purple generally are not, not there. And uh, those are extra spectral colors, which in the chromatistic diagram are uh, denoted by the purple line across the bottom. But I should say also that there are two different systems of color primaries. There are additive primaries for uh, light emitting and there are subtractive primaries for um, paints and inks and uh, materials which absorb something out of the incident light, shine white light onto a coloured surface, something like this. And it, um, it uh, reflects those wavelengths which are not absorbed. And suppose that you have two sources of white light. You place a blue filter over the one and the yellow filter over the other. And then you su superimpose the beams from, uh, from both sources. What colour do you see on the screen? So you have the yellow filter on one. And a uh, yellow filter on one light source and a, uh, a blue filter on the other. You superimpose the images and you see which colour. What do you expect? Uh, well, I expect, um, I think it's a secret, uh, not terribly. Uh, you get green. Yeah, I agree, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, Whereas, if, um, if you put yellow and blue filters yes. um, together, Yeah, right. That's the 
blue filter. I don't have a yellow filter, unfortunately. So. No, but the thing is, you need to demonstrate um, exactly yes. 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 And I remember looking about um, these instructions, and I remember also um, mentioning that there might be a link between the spectrum and the music, and you believe that there, that there, was, there was something interesting going on, but I couldn't exactly remember what you thought or what the connection might be. I was wondering if you had any information about that. Yes, there's a phenomenon called chromos synesthesia which is the uh, mixing of senses for the color. And it's, it certainly exists, and maybe a slight percent of the population experiences. So when they see colors, they'll hear certain musical notes, called them, I suppose. But it seems to be quite idiosyncratic. There's not some general law about it. So you have two separate people with both experience that they probably have different aspects. This is D major, one, one person will see red and the other will see yellow. But it's a very interesting thing. And some famous composers, like Scriari, for example, have tried to exploit this. But um, the difficulty is that the effects that he was seeing when he composed it were not necessarily communicated to the, the audience. Technical abilities 
has had a constitutive role as a scientific tool, contributing to the development of observation, experiment, archiving, and illustration. Pretty much immediately after its invention, photography became celebrated as a progressive, ideal instrument of the Enlightenment emphasis on scientific observation and knowledge. The early history of photography was characterized by the assumptions of photographs being automatic recordings made by an impartial machine that produced unmediated, faithful, evidential, exact copies of reality. With their superabundance of indiscriminate detail and clarity, producing the convincing illusion of transparency similar to natural vision, photographs are still customarily considered literal records, so traces of their subjects. We talk about the inherently indexical photographic relation to reference and thus reality. So the seek to fulfill idea and the rationalist and positivist criteria of mechanical objectivity and reliability, being free of the subjectivity of human error and the, the human sensory perception, crucial for successful scientific observation. Um, photographic techniques with a varied range of um, capabilities for different purposes came to produce entirely new kinds of empirical evidence. Um, through their unique abilities of gathering wide ranges of electromagnetic radiation over periods of time, their filtering, enlarging, and condensing this information, and thereby essentially generating images of, by rendering visible records of invisible entities. The perceived faithful indexicality, registering minute and even incidental detail, um, actuated various scientific measuring practices to extract and generate non-visual data from the photographic recordings and inspired experimental photographic methods for producing abstract diagrammatic data. So these evidential um, and all sorts of uses that photographs were employed in under the positivist efforts have greatly influenced the general status of the photograph, which is habitually considered to be descriptive and truthful empirical proof and thereby further supporting the faith in photography as a scientific, experimental and illustrational tool. Now, the cutting edge scientific imaging has now shifted from photographic towards um, purely digital computer-generated imagery. And the cultural meanings uh, and expectations for digital images are different, um, yet vast amounts of the visually convincingly similar electronic images still capitalize relatively inconspicuously um, on the irrational evidentiary authority of the photographic image, as they simulate the photographic truth through a continuity of photographic visual codes, that is, their visual resemblance to photographic images in clarity, uh, detail, and depth of field. Even though, in fact, they refer to real primarily through iconographic rather than um, inherently or necessarily lexical resemblance. So despite the prevalent discourses on the problematic status of photographs in general, um, intensified obviously by the emergence of digital technologies, it's quite fascinating and at the same time unsettling how little the accuracy, the validity, uh, or the implications of scientific illustrations as supposedly truthful evidences in public scientific discourses are actually discussed. And how readily and unnoticed the use of imagery to illustrate, clarify, and even ostensibly evidence scientific information is accepted. So, imaging has a particularly prominent role in Western medical practices, where cultural theorist Lisa Cartwright suggests um, torrents of specialist imaging techniques are perceived superior, more authoritative, and more reliable than direct observation. Uh, the discovery of X-rays in the 1890s was revolutionary. It introduced a sensational, unprecedented method for observa observation, revealing hidden structures and enforcing the notion of underlying invisible sea shape of things that was detectable through these special machines. And it generated these magical sites of the previously unseen, and it allowed us to see inside a human being. Um, it advanced and revolutionized medical practices, of course, uh, but it profoundly transported and broadened the notions around photography in the process as well. The photography, um, because it's uh, recording of 
radiation, um, X-rays were supposed to were supposed to be photographic uh, recordings. Now, a multitude of useful non-invasive diagnostic techniques have been developed for medical purposes since. Um, now we have CT scans, MRIs, PET scans, EEG graphs, and we've got ultrasound imaging. Um, the cultural status of the fetal sonograms is a great example of how scientific imagery is invested with deep, inseparable social, cultural, uh, even emotional meanings. Um, beyond the professional informational meanings and functions. They consider it to be the first portrait of the child to be. Fetal sonograms allow for visual bonding with the future child and bestowing the fetus a personhood and um, a social status. Um, consequently, uh, they also play an iconic role in, for instance, political and abortion debates. But they're very popular, both in uh, private and in public sector. I mean, this is from the NHS Trust website. Um, while commonly understood as a kind of window into the body, ultrasound images are, however, factually visual representations of sound wave measurements. They are neither inherently nor necessarily visual. They're analyzed by computers and rendered as images due to our cultural preference for visual representation. The scientific imaging is part of a larger scoping and ideological regime of Western visuality. It's founded on the dominant Western mindset, um, on the, based on the Enlightenment philosophy, Cartesian dualism, and the mathematical, rational, and rationalizing model of linear perspective which secures and addresses the humanist viewer as the dominant, rational, observing centre of the world. That's what perspective does mean with this human centre. Underlying the current epistemology, emphasising advanced technologies and covering invisible secrets is the historical Western notion that truth lies beneath the surface and needs to be seen to be fully understood, which stems from the early Greek philosophy. The resulting imposing status of vision as the primary means of obtaining, analyzing, and ordering knowledge has been pivotal in not only formulating the modern understanding of existence as a primarily visual concept and centering scientific practices around observation, but through our reliance on visual proof, also enforcing the status of images in asserting veracity, conferring importance, and defining reality. The age-old association of seeing to knowing has been bolstered by the growing numbers of observational devices and optical instruments for seeing more, further, and better. We started with the 17th century development of opt optical telescopes and microscopes. Now in the 20th century, non-optical imaging techniques were developed beyond the limitations of optical lenses and visible light. Now scanning electron microscopes, using streams of electrons controlled by electric or magnetic fields, are capable of depicting minute objects like cells and turning insects into these now so familiar and scary monsters. And they generate captivating pictorial representations of astonishing magnification, detail and depth of field. Scanning tunneling electron microscopes, tracing the surface of the sample, with a very fine needle recording the flow of electrons between the needle tip and the sample um, are even capable of generating recordings of individual atoms. Apparently, that's what we are told. Providing the principal access to these invisible realities, the omnipresent, popularized, highly processed and often diagrammatic computer-generated illustrations, which are carefully geared towards and selected for their visual impact, create an acquired catalogue of visual notions, designating, assigning, and consolidating visual appearances to invisible entities. Such imagery profoundly molds how both laymen and experts see, experience, understand, and visualize the world by transforming our thinking of such unforeseen things. If I asked you to imagine what the DNA looks like, the chances are you'd be thinking of you know, something like this. Or maybe something like this, or maybe something like this. These are all computer generated graphical illustrations representing the structure of DNA, but they're not what DNA looks like. This DNA doesn't really look like anything, 
because it's not visible to the human eye. And the ubiquity of these generic, generic computer-generated illustrations of the double helical structure of DNA do point and testify to the influence uh, that the dominant um, the dominance of a highly distinct scientific illustration mode, such as the DNA, can have on public perceptions. Some imaging techniques, of course, produce results very faithful to actuality, like when photographing microscopic samples. But the procedures prior to the capture can actually modify the objects quite a lot. For the purposes of microscopic study and imaging, the specimens are treated in various ways, including separating, isolating, slicing, flattening, dyeing, freezing, drying, peeling of layers. All the resulting microcups reveal internal structures and other features. The methods often alter the appearances of the sample so drastically that they effectively render the original visual characters unrecognizable in the process. When genuine colors may reveal information about a variety of phenomena and substances, artificial colors are often designed not to replicate reality, but to emphasize areas of interest and enhance readability. Such a treatment can serve both genuine diagnostic and informational reasons, but also purely visual purposes. To, to the vast array of imagery that's generated algorithmically from innately non-visual data, coloring is added afterwards, subjectively and arbitrarily, without any universal code, um, both, again, for generally useful and informative reasons, but also purely to create more aesthetically appealing and lucid false color images. Largely because the lay viewer, that's attuned to the world of color representation, expects to see color. In the modern media environment, visually captivating imagery seems to command easy public visibility. The modern scientific visual communication parallels um, the general Representational conventions in cleanness, sharpness, minute detail, the use of color and linear perspective, um, and blends effortlessly into the mostly highly visual contemporary consumer and information culture. So, utilizing this constructive perspective and artificial coloring, typically conforming to the Western pictorial tradition, brings to a scientific use of widely varying scales and content attractive, intriguing, otherworldly, and even sublime landscapes of sort. Yet they're simultaneously effectively alienated from any natural visual experience that we might have of the content. As abundances of these seismic images that have been shown quite clearly testify, despite their striking visual impact, these images are exceptionally dependent on the accompanying verbal to supply, contextualize, and secure their reading and meaning. And due to the decontextualizing, decontextualization inherent in the failing sense of context and scale, the images and images not really correlating with any actual visual, visual experiences other than other similar illustrations. The Hubble Space Telescope imagery published by NASA is a good and well-known example uh, the publicity surrounding uh, the Hubble portrays glorified in the widely circulating, fascinating, visually appealing, iconic images as revolutionizing our understanding of the space by revealing unsuspecting secrets. All of the discoveries have, of course, um, contributed to astronomical knowledge. The data is not visual, nor is it primarily intended for imaging purposes. It's numeric, intensity measurements of physical properties exceeding the abilities of human vision and visual representation. The Hubble is a telescope, it gathers and measures radiation, it's not a camera. Um, Hubble's instruments reach beyond the spectrum of visible electromagnetic radiation, but they only detect the intensities of radiation monochromatically. So the data used constructs many of the released iconic, stunningly colorful detailed images is collected from a range of different types of devices and detectors, measuring different visible and invisible wavelength ranges, intensities, and radiation types. During multiple separate successive exposures of varying exposure times and apertures, through an array of combinations of filters 
uh, polarizers and masks blocking out unwanted radiation. The data sets are separately calibrated, electronically overlaid. Carefully enhanced colored and altered through both automated and subjective imaging processing techniques to reveal and exaggerate the desired subtle, otherwise invisible features. Before merging them together to represent one combination of distinctly different types of phenomena in false colored layers in a single artificially constructed visual representation. Many astronomical images are composite mosaics, merging data from copious alike close up images. They are collected over long periods of time by mapping the target with successive scans through even consecutive satellites and probes and various separate telescopes based at the catch locations on Earth. The heavy constructive production processes in fact create artificial hybrids, shattering the notion of photographic moments and thereby the associated indexable promise of truth that the visual photorealistic reference nevertheless seems to subtly evoke. The highly complex imaging processing lacks regulation and uniform protocols False coloring does not follow consistent codes, but color ranges are assigned case by case to highlight varying case specific features and interests, and they represent a variety of different aspects of the data. Deliberately assigning colors, adjusting contrast, and choosing orientation, composition, and framing, primarily in adherence to the intentionally developed calculated aesthetic side. Saturated colors, high contrast, rich detail, majestic composition, dramatic lighting, maximizes the aesthetic appeal um, and the visual potential of the data to get the greatest attention and enthusiasm. And I guess that's written a brilliant book um, on the imaging practices, aesthetically attractive images for regular public release, because they understand the publicity role of visually appealing stunning images in promoting and evidencing the significance and the successfulness of their project, mainly for uh, public and political visibility and for funding reasons. But the distinct appearance of these images is defined by the visual perception of the universe, conditioning us to imagine and expect to see the cosmos in a certain way, in, in brilliant colour. Um, thus, the profoundly shaping and the collective consciousness, uh, perceptions and imagination. Many scientists really recognize the profoundly animal role of images. They are not optimally suited to scientific ideals of exactitude and abstraction, which are perceived to be better fulfilled by exact numeric data. But we construct our thinking through reference on existing experiences. So all encountered images accumulate to construct one's own subjective reality, which in turn informs our imaginations. It is often noted in association to the photographic scene that once one learns to see in a certain way, the effect can't be undone. Um, so simply refuting an image will not refute, uh, reverse its power or uh, kind of reverse the impact. Um, and the compelling visual impact of these aesthetically appealing scientific images um, generates lasting, vibrant, subliminal emotional responses. Um, where even when the manufactured nature of the images is stated. The most pressing issue, particularly with inherently invisible things, is not that we would see these images as like unmanipulated. It's that our visual information originates solely from pictorial representations rather than from first-hand observation obviously, uh, and the established conventions of visualizing these entities dictate how we come to understand them. So maybe we, artists and scientists, should seek to diversify the methods for representation in utilitarian contexts, such as simultaneously provide several different suggestions for potential approaches to envisioning the represented entities. I will leave you with this image by artist Steve Miller, Using genuine scientific notes, diagrams, and computer generated models of cells and protein structures, the artwork in his protein series points to the unfixed visual nature of such unseen realities through morphing different looking approaches together. Representing cutting edge scientific illustration, stripped of the usual sleek digital clinicality through silk screen here, uh, points to their nature as products of human.
human imagination, just like art, rather than as outputs of some impersonal mechanical process guaranteeing automated objectivity. Thank you.
So I think this meeting uh, selected here is a particularly interesting one because the shapes, the, the, the kind of larger forms that this very representational view of protein structure has at the top is there to effectively abstract away unnecessary detail to show the kind of macro structure of the protein. But um, just to come back to what was being discussed earlier, I, I like this image for that. It, it sort of shows that, in fact, with what you're talking about, there are many different types of visualization that have many different purposes, so we shouldn't really color them all with the same brush. But in terms of visualization, the danger of visualization, I do think it actually raised a very relevant point. Having uh, taught a course on dangers of uh, trying to overly strongly emphasize things within visualizations for university, I would say that scientists don't necessarily come with either the education or the discipline to resist showing up the nice parts of their data. They do it with charts, they do it with graphics, they do it with visualizations. So I think it is a very important part of scientific training that people are taught not to oversell their data through showing visualizations. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for this because I've had most bitter conversations with fellow, um, with friends who are scientists. I'm an architect, and I've had so many discussions about cheap Photoshop in NASA I do. And tell them this is just cheap atheist Photoshop. And they go like, no, oh, no, it's data. Oh, so you think it's a picture? Yeah, yeah, it's a picture. And you know, these are physicists and real scientists who are quite ignorant about the, the depth and, and the voids and the problems of even software programming. I mean, I used to use a 3D software which was called Z, which now is superseded by other softwares. And there, were, there was problems with algorithms and, and reverse geometry. So if you put in a, a formula and you reverse the geometry, the result was totally different. And sometimes I think that scientists are not aware of this, and you know, this is about being interdisciplinary. So I think you get the point straight. And, yeah, thank you. Um, great presentation, very stimulating, obviously. Um, I, I want a question to you. But below all this, is there a political dimension or a political economy dimension in terms of what it, what is shown, how it's shown? Um, and who can see what's being shown? Uh, there's definitely political dimensions, um, at least to how things are shown, um, which is related to the, the idea of saying about Western visuality, that the way that we represent things is, is, is very important in how we construct our reality. And, I mean, science is a very important part of our society. It's used a lot in legislation, you know, that's, you know, you, they make laws to make things healthier, for instance. Um, and science has been big ingredients in that. Um, it's all linked in, in sort of like these power structures. Um, the way that society is seen um, is definitely got an impact on, on scientific imaging as well. They will show certain type of things in a certain kind of way. A lot of it is not necessarily conscious either. Um, there's like a habit of showing scientific images with these beautiful colors, kind of like they're uplifting, because usually scientific discoveries, they, they're great. So scientists want to communicate the fact that they discovered something brilliant and you know, amazing and unusual, and kind of doing it in bright colors, just the way that our culture does it. If, if you look at advertising, I mean, these images aren't very different from advertising images. They kind of just use the same visual language, just different aspects of it. To be continued. Right, thank you very much. Uh, I think we're all worked up. Sounds good. Um, so yeah, I started out with the. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry to have such a, a kind of like vague introduction. I'll sort of put a bit of a spin on it. Um, it, it, it is it is difficult uh, even for myself to uh, figure out what I'm doing from one end to the next. Uh, just just to have a bit of a background, um, I I come from 
uh, studied illustration. I started out doing illustration um, animation, moved on to cell animation. Uh, from there, I moved on to multimedia uh, back in the early days. Uh, then, about 10 years in the video games industry here in London. And then, uh, moving on after that to 10 years in um, interactive software um, at a company called Audition, which was pioneering. Think, uh, things in stereo vision, augmented reality, virtual reality, haptic touch interfaces, and uh, really public events, and something that is now defined as pervasive computing, uh, in that it uh, uses sensors for inputs and uh, you know, does something so you can interact with the, uh, the virtual world, uh, and, and is actually moving to our, um, you know, our, uh, our smartphones. So, what I've um, done is, uh, I'm going to start to go over the questions that I've been asking um, as we move into the virtual. Here's just an interesting image of, I found on the net of uh, someone where this the smog gets very bad in Hong Kong. Uh, they've got this nice backdrop up so they can still take the pictures. Um, so, uh, what I, part, of, uh, part of the research group, um, um, that I'm involved with at the uh, University of Westminster. It's the uh, called Serious Games at Westminster. Uh, it does involve virtual reality and augmented reality. And um, what it's uh, what it's looking at is um, is is actually sorry. Is there a way we can get notes up on here? Or is this just one screen? I neither mean nor had I combined them to insert. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Lindsay was working with two screens. Ah. And that seemed the only way. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. okay, that's right. Um, so, what we've got is uh, I'm coming from games creation, and what we. Uh, back, back in the 90s, so I'll, I'll just take us back for a moment. Uh, what I was doing is uh, working for some large companies such as Sony Signosis or Philips uh, and the NDEA. And, uh, at some point, I broke away from that, and uh, a couple of freelancers would be like a programmer, um, an artist, or a games designer. We would make a core unit of, um, of something that uh, is similar to the film model, where you, you have a small creative core, bring in the freelancers as needed, and uh, keep the costs down, and, uh, and kind of um, you know, ramp up when needed for doing games. Uh, and then move, you know, kind of slough off when, when needed. Uh, so what we were doing is uh, converting a couple of games to the original PlayStation, one of which was Duke Nukem and one of which was Unreal, uh, the name which you may know of now as a, uh, as a games engine which people use, uh, you know, which games developers use in order to not have to create an entire bespoke 3D world every time, you know, from the ground up, uh, but can just bring in their own assets and uh, very quickly get up and running with that. Um, so uh, what we were doing, uh, we didn't know what that about is uh, now known as the wide load model, apparently, and uh, it's uh, it's working working very well for a while, and uh, you know some interesting th things happening. We got Duke Nukem out to good acclaim, uh, and. Uh, had just pretty much finished a working version of Unreal, running at about 17 frames per second, unoptimized. Uh, it's ready to go. Unfortunately, that got cancelled for the fact that uh, PlayStation 2 is coming out. And um, and the reason I'm telling you that story is uh, is there's something interesting coming later in regards to that. Uh, and it's at a time where we're really starting to have um, this physical to digital threshold. So gaming is coming from a more physical environment to one which is uh, which is purely digital with the um, uh, with with a more co-creation and, and a networked um, uh, this sort of uh, modification. You know where you have loads of designers create, creating uh, games mods or, or levels. Um, such as you would have with uh, with the original Doom, which came out with its own level creator. Uh, immediately, they uh, started to have um, you know people on the net trading these levels. So what we what we did for this game is uh, we were hiring designers, 
uh, we would get the best designers off the internet. Uh, invariably, they turned out to be 16 years old. So uh, what would happen is their parents were wondering what these 30-year-old men were trying to do hiring their 16-year-old sons uh, via the internet. So that involved some uh, cups of tea and explanations in living rooms. Uh, but it led us to, um, to this, which is about 13 or 14 later. So I started to get a, 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 you know, I started to get contacted and started to get uh, images uh, and, and you know, forms springing up on the net, this net. Uh, they would, uh, I started to get these emails from Eastern Europe that were saying, well, we're trying to reconstruct this, um, uh, this game, this Unreal PSX game. Uh, we have these images, and these are images that were on my hard drive. Um, I, I, it's a bit of a shock to see them, you know, kind of plastered all over the net, and to read forums of, of people just uh, talking about how they were, you know, digitally reconstructing this. It's a bit of, it was a nice bit of detective work. And um, one of the interesting things is, you know, obviously it's, it's very commercially a legal gray area. So here we are, we have this nearly finished version on our hard drives, which we can't release. We could do a pirate release, but um, you know, they would know who we are and, and where we got it. Uh, but then we have um, this, this gray area, this modding community, where the, the go ahead and they've actually you know, been inspired from the, uh, the, the scraps that they've seen, and they've gone ahead and they're starting to reconstruct this uh, uh, this game, you can see one of the uh, images in comparison to the original character I did. So I'm, I'm following this, you know, kind of with some interest, um, even though I'm not legally allowed to uh, have a communication with the, uh, with the new owners of this property. Uh, but it's something that uh, makes me very interested in um, how there's this, been this, this sort of handover in content creation. Uh, you know, back at the time we were on the, uh, you know, I'm on the dialogue, which is costing you know, about 100 pounds a month. Uh, whereas now we have a low entry point. Everybody's got uh, broadband um, uh, and access to these uh, these editing uh, tools that comes with the games, so they can very easily get into this co-creation um, sort of environment. Uh, so it. It got me to think about the concepts behind uh, our journey from this uh, this physical uh, game system to a more um, digital one. Uh, the, the idea being that uh, back in the days of the arcades in the 70s, you would have uh, this physical scarcity of an actual arcade uh, environment. So you'd have to travel to get to this, uh, a certain locality. There was, a, there was a high barrier to entry, uh, either in cost, uh, just uh, feeding quarters to the machine, or um, uh, maybe if you had developed a higher skill, you could continue to play with a lower cost. Uh, but whichever way, you were spending a lot of time at this. Um, as well, the interaction was more of a linear program narrative. Uh, the programmers had complete control over what was happening. There was no uh, real adjustments to that. Uh, scoring again is set up the permanent program. Um, it comes to a broadcast, so you can actually broadcast um, a high score you might get, but this is a local broadcast uh, and only over the high score table. And interestingly, this is the only place where you can actually add some content of your own, uh, which people will uh, remember. Um, you can find all the three letter swear words you would like on the uh, local high score table on the arcades. Uh, so uh, it also has a public-private element. Uh, you have a private play, but uh, um, obviously you have observers, you have a social element of people interacting. Uh, this brings us to now. So really, the Games Arcade was the first virtual commercial portal. Um, and it's very much locked in one place. Eventually, they came into our homes. Uh, later, uh, obviously, this is tracking our development our development of the computer, our development as we become networked with this uh, with this virtual environment of, uh, of, of information richness. Uh, and one 
the word used to describe this is uh, post-humanism, you know, uh, whereas biologically we, we're not evolving very quickly. Um, what is evolving us now is our interface with this virtual world uh, as we become more post-human. So what we have now is uh, these commercial portable virtual portals that we carry with us. Um, the entry barrier is low. The cost entry barrier is low. The contract is deferred over 24 or 48 months. And uh, these devices are always on with a high uh, level of, uh, of information exchange. Uh, the, inter the interaction is actually the commercially mediated, strongly mediated by um, by larger technocratic systems, and uh, this is, uh, you know, by, by the hardware, by the software, you know, maybe you can only interact by it in likes and dislikes. Uh, the broadcast, there's wide broadcast, but also mediated output, and uh, there's also public-private um, elements. Uh, part of this is giving up privacy, part of this is giving up identification information, uh, and shifting borders involved in that, and sometimes the end use of all this data is very opaque. Uh, so my interest in this is uh, I want to reflect some of our journey from back then in a more physical time uh, to where we are now, in that I'm taking some, uh, I, I created a work called Enter for High Score with a, uh, a mock-up here you see at the side, uh, at the side a bit of an arcade um, standalone totem system. And the idea was to take this, um, you know, disruptive quality you see here on the, uh, on the speed, uh, on the speed uh, radar, uh, where they've tap tacked on their, uh, their own individual high scores. And uh, some of the uh, creative aspects of uh, entering, you know, say, you know, creating a text avatar of yourself uh, once you've won the right to, uh, to broadcast your name. And uh, I've mocked it up, and what I've done is I've had the, um, on the left-hand side is the highest scoring uh, text input. On the middle is the latest entries, and on the right is the lowest scoring. And this is all programmed up in Java, and it's moving very quickly, as quickly as it's a live system that uh, as soon as the enter it goes in. Uh, so you have an entry system in the middle, um, uh, you have a, an actual sending system on the left, which will send uh, entries to the, uh, the right arcade machine, which has volume. So I wanted to have a physical interaction, um, something that would entice people, uh, as the old arcade machines would, something familiar. And uh, there's also the added um, enticements of uh, creating a miniature narrative um, up to 15 characters. It could be uh, just a creative bit of text. It could be something um, uh, almost like an avatar of yourself. And this is something that that's, uh, was received with a great deal of interest. This was done at Goldsmiths as part of the Creative uh, Computational Arts uh, Masters. And uh, lots of good feedback. And I did say I was interested in the disruptive element of it. And um, here you see a photo of the finished work. Uh, with, with the kind, you can see the, uh, where you have a, a private area to yourself, and also you, know, you can actually interact with other people who are using it. And also you have the broadcasting elements. But uh, if you look closely as I change the slide, um, there is the disruptive element. I'll obviously edit it for uh, PG. Uh, this is actually what I was interested in. I wanted to see what was going to happen, um, and, and sure enough, it did. So uh, there's a certain amount of, you know, uh, and in fact, this is this is what's happening on the net as well. You know, uh, large swaths of the net are uh, full of very bad behavior. So it's something that reflects that. I think I like to think it's the, the authentic human breaking through our post-human mediation, if you will. Um, so. Done that. Uh, just to kind of put a bit of a recap on my past 10 years to show you what I'm working on now with the research. Uh, when we're doing the pervasive computing, we're doing a lot of um, varied work for a lot of varied clients. Uh, this was done for the BBC Bengos of Theory. Uh, 
just to show the, the range of, of kind of like interaction we do. This is a um, markerless motion capture booth. Uh, yes, it's before the Kinect. Uh, so when the Kinect came out, that was all pretty much obsolete. But what we're doing is, um, I don't know if you remember, um, I think it was Dr. Yen who was on that, or one of the presenters, but he uh, wanted to do, and I think it was with the, in connection with the University of Nottingham, uh, to do a study of dance movement. So he, was, he had people dance to the same track, and the idea was uh, you would capture the motion, put it onto a blank avatar, show it to members of the opposite sex, and say, what do you find attractive in this dance? So the upshot of the uh, study was that um, bold movements uh, and, and strong motions is attractive to the opposite sex. So there you go. There's <laughs> useful information, you know, very decisive movements. <laughs> um, uh, also did some work for uh, Top Gear, uh, Top Gear Live show, which uh, tours around the world. And we did a mixed reality. Well, we did, we were doing, we did about a, you know, from about 2006 on, something every year for them. And this was a mixed reality show where we had a, a Gaxo, Gaxo dragon, kind of a futuristic uh, embodiment of the, uh, of the nanny state uh, that was attacking um, the Stig and Jeremy Clarkson. And the Stig was driving around this uh, large projection, stereo projection of this Gaxo dragon. And everything was timed so that the dragon would fire at uh, the stick as he's driving, and uh, pyrotechnics would go up. Uh, eventually, Jeremy Clarkson would come out with a bazooka, shoot the thing, and it would blow up. And uh, happy to say that uh, I worked with Jeremy Clarkson, and I have nothing, you know, no more to <laughs> um, It also did for the uh, interesting thing uh, for the um, gadget show. <laughs> Uh, we did a live avatar of Susie Perry, where we, uh, we had her in the markerless motion capture system. Uh, we were streaming the data over the internet uh, for motion capture to a, uh, a model, a 3D model of Susie Perry in the studio in Birmingham. Composite that on top of the actual live footage, and then filming it with a JSON robot who was controlled by AI. And uh, we did a, a competition to see which was the best avatar. Um, happily we won that. I think that the AI and the Jason robot broke down at some point. But it's um, something that went on to, to continue on with their live show and uh, it's an interesting use of the motion capture I think to try and drive an avatar. Um, uh, previously uh, I don't think they'd actually used that aspect of the software um, because when I called up for technical support um, they said I was the first. So uh, it's, it's very easy to go down the route where you become an expert in something just because uh, you, you know you, you narrow it down to that aspect. Um, animation, you know what good function curves look like. Function curves are the uh, 2D kind of representation of how the body is moving. So and either work to a recipe and get a nice walk cycle or other animation, or 
just doing something very disruptive and having a bit haywire, which will probably be more interesting. Um, and moving on, uh, we just have, uh, just to get on to the research that I am doing, uh, we're doing some augmented and virtual reality research uh, to the end of, um, as we move, it, virtual devices are now becoming inevitable um, in a rather haphazard manner, you know. Do we need them? We're not sure. Uh, one reason, uh, one strong reason for needing them is as we move towards immersive environments, uh, the control systems we have, which are uh, typical GUIs, you know, graphical user interfaces such as a mouse and keyboard, don't have the um, complexity of interaction in order to uh, fully navigate these. So part of my remit is to look into these perceptual user interfaces of which there are just a myriad. Uh, before you even start to combine them, and to actually come up with a framework so that we can start to quantify the benefits and start to compare them to each other, uh, so we can more rapidly iterate and start to um, uh, come up with optimal systems. Uh, and uh, part of that is uh, where we can, you know, just just as a, an example, there's. Um, a system come up with much in its way called lazy nav, whereby uh, people would normally use the connect system and they wave their hands around quite a bit, it's a bit tiring. Uh, whereas with lazy nav, um, it's, it really takes measurements from the torso. If you just lean to one side or the other, you actually start to navigate through an environment and just lean forward and, and just making it very, you know, low impact. Um, uh, Low cognitive load uh, and uh, have the have the control um, fit the task a bit better. Something uh, that that will actually uh, make it a bit easier. Uh, to the end, where you, you can do something like just look at uh, use eye tracking to select objects and use a low vocalization to confirm it, uh, and that may even uh, allow us to do things like uh, navigating through 3D environments uh, in a way called clutching. So if you have like a, a mouse and you get to the end of the screen and you pick it up and move it to the other end so you can continue moving, that's clutching. So if we can do something like that in 3D, that'll be um, a very effective uh, way of doing things. And then I'll wrap it up. I think it must be like uh, over time by now. It's just been fine. Okay, well, I'll just, I'll just wrap it up with a bit of uh, Fun. Um, uh, you have to know when to go low tech. So um, this is something uh, that I had some fun with for a while. Uh, how it started was um, one of my landmark birthdays. Uh, the, the choice is either you know you be quiet about it, or you you know just say, well, let's go for it. So I went for it. Um, the concept I came up with is I thought of a few things in conjunction. Uh, one of them was to get these uh, Fisher Price record players together. Uh, something I remember from uh, from my youth. And uh, I started eBaying them, getting them in, and seeing if I could work with them to do something, uh, some sort of uh, broadcast piece. Uh, what I found is the ones shipping over from the States. Um, they had something called a squirrel cage motor, and this motor is tied to the uh, to the electricity supply as far as the cycle. So the speed it ran at was uh, dependent on the power supply. So seeing as the, the one that states is um, 17 and a half percent faster than the one we have here, uh, the records are playing slowly here. So uh, just one of the many things that you find out when you start to try and do something practical that you run up against roadblocks. So what I had to do is actually stop buying these and start buying the Fisher Price 820, which was battery powered, um, so therefore non-dependent on power cycles, and um, had an interesting side effect as well. So I'm buying these on eBay, and over the period of about, about a month, um, the global price of the Fisher Price 820 spiked from about ten dollars per unit to over a hundred. Uh, as I amassed a uh, significant quantity of them. So, uh, very annoying in the end, I had to stop buying them. But uh, I did find, get a great find, uh, 2300 Jukebox 45, so a period of 89 to 91, that golden 
age. Uh, and I feel it represents a, a period of time before the digitization of uh, music had that well and truly even started. But um, it also represents a time where you have a whole system that's building up. So there's a whole curation and, um, and filtering system whereby by the time you get to having a jukebox 45, you might not like the song, you might not like the genre, but there's something about it. It's gone through a process, it's gone through a craft. And uh, what I've found with people listening to these is uh, you, you tend to like them, you tend to enjoy them, you remember them, they have very good um, resonance and memories. And uh, it seems to work out quite well. So there's a certain curation involved, there's a certain time period, even before we get to the uh, interaction. So what was going on with, um, with this is, um, so the final element I add to the mix is the, uh, the Mickey Mouse gloves. And this allowed for a leveling of the playing field. So if you had any DJs in, in the uh, room, they're immediately brought down to everyone else's level. And anyone who was not a DJ felt, well, you know, confident enough, well, I can have, I can have a try at that, you know, it's, uh, it's not bad. So as you can see, as, as the evening, and this is um, what happened is uh, I did it first for the birthday, and then it developed a life of its own to the point where I would just go around to pubs. Um, sometimes, where I didn't know anyone, and just set up, and, and the thing would just spontaneously happen. And at some point in the evening, it would just get really, really messy. Uh, you know, people would be pouring bottles of wine into the mixer, and uh, the thing is, the equipment just kept going. It's, it's like a tank. So, um, as you can see, I have the uh, I have the majestic wine bins. They have the uh, the 45, uh, the 2345s in there. So you have to you have to pick through them with the gloves on. You must wear the gloves. Um, and so there's a certain amount of uh, editing, curation, broadcast. Uh, people would set themselves up to. Um, uh, it was self policing. I was not involved. So people would uh, police the uh, the time on the decks themselves, and it seemed to work out pretty well. And uh, also another interesting aspect is, um, is that uh, people would, uh, well here's the rules, there's only a small set of rules, uh, start out with two rules, um, and eventually we evolved three rules because there were so many copies of Crystal Waters and someone always played it that uh, I couldn't bear it anymore, so the third rule came into effect. Um, and an interesting thing that happened as well, I thought people would get up and DJ by themselves. Nearly always it was two people. So um, I think you know it's the work needed to be shared, and you can see you have to adjust the, the knobs as well. It's reasonably difficult. But these work guys were incredibly good. It's amazing some of the things that came through. They're, they're actually very, very adept and, and made some really amazing choices. Um, and just, uh, you know, it, it tends to break down the whole, you know, uh, audience performer barrier. And there is one thing that I've taken away from this, um, more than anything else, uh, one artist that uh, had a wide selection of tracks, a uh, very selection over that period, and whenever he was played, um, it worked. No matter what the situation, it was um, at, you know, early in the evening, late in the evening, different crowds, old, young, ironic, non-ironic, uh, and you know, just a newfound respect. Um, and I'm not, I am being serious. It, it, it actually really, really works every time. So uh, I'm going to leave it on that. And thanks for the questions. <laughs> Thank you. Um, two quick questions. Um, going, going back a little bit, the, um, 
the project way at the, the high school boards. How did you do the scoring system? What was it in scoring? Uh, uh, people would vote on their own. Uh, there was a voting station. Sorry if I wasn't very clear about that, but one of the arcade machines was a voting station. Um, you had a, a red button and a green button, obviously up and down. And as soon as you did a vote, um, it would refresh it with a new entry. So, how did people get an active school? They, they would vote it down. Oh, they would vote it down below zero. Yeah, they had the ground button. Yeah. Harsh. Yeah. Okay, okay um, and then one observation just on the. Um, I'll ask them if you're part of what I do. I've noticed um, uh, during parties now, when people have been spotted by the to the high or whatever, people will put like five or ten tracks on to kind of play next. And so you get like an half, a half an hour of, oh my god, you've broken this half an hour. And it must be really nice to have that kind of vinyl where you can you get a couple and you can't get bored of by standing next to that and you like something else again. Just an observation. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's interesting because you, you're seeing their their kind of uh, uh, you, you know, it's a it's a live effect as well, you know, and um, you, you, you're talking about editorial choices uh, of, of the uh, the set list, yeah. 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 Uh, it's, it's good to see control sometimes. Any others? Uh, someone about your um, how accurate sort of stroke realistic is your use of sine waves for the movement? Uh, is it near enough or is it pretty precise? Well, um, there's a lot of movement, even just in a walk cycle, that uh, it is cannot be represented by sine waves, so like when the foot hits the floor and, uh, and kind of steps down. Uh, I couldn't do that just with a sine wave. I'd have to um, start adjusting it somehow. So really, it's, it's just what I can do with, with uh, something cycling like that. Because the mention uh, the, the sounds in my mind of somebody who's spoken previously about that everything was made with sine waves. So mm. Very, very essential. It's also yeah, an excellent direct links between the uh, movement capture and what we were showing with um, arrays, motion capture. So, um, another hello. Hello. Just a closing comment. I think we're going to have to amend the guidelines for that to those speakers to say no for comments. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe.